Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. And welcome to the scientist.com Inside Scientific and Stem Cell Technologies webinar titled Assessing Antigen-Specific T-Cell Functionality with Dendritic Cell and CD8 Positive T-Cell Co-Culture. I'm Liam Sanyo for the events team here at scientist.com, and I'll be your host today. We're being joined by Dr. Catherine Ewan, Senior Scientist in Research and Development at Stem Cell Technologies, who will discuss how to set up dendritic cell and CD positive T cell co cultures experiments and assess T cell proliferation and activity. And with that, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Catherine Ewan. Catherine, thanks so much for joining us today, and the floor is yours whenever you're ready. Thank you, Leo, for the introduction and the opportunity to speak today. Also, a big thank you to our audience for choosing to spend your valuable time with us. Uh, I'm really looking forward to our conversation today on DC T cell co cultures. I'm Catherine Ewan, I'm a senior scientist at Stem Cell Technologies. I've worked in research and development for the past eight years where I've been involved in product development, product support, and application development to support our immunology-focused customers. And it's this role that has led me down the path of DC T-cell co-cultures as it is a versatile and dynamic immune assay that can be applied to many types of research questions. So today's seminar will be focused on examples of these co-cultures and how we can use them as a tool to better understand antigen-specific CD8 T-cells. Our agenda today will cover various aspects of DC T-cell co-cultures, including a quick overview of antigen presentation and processing, cell, source, cell sources for culture, and some tips and tricks for optimizing your culture system. And finally, some examples of how we can use DC T-cell co-cultures for our research. So let's start with a brief and general overview of the co-culture workflow. D8 T cells, and finally we will harvest the co-cultures for a variety of downstream applications. As I mentioned earlier, DC T cell co-cultures can be utilized to help us understand a wide variety of questions in our immunological research. And some of those questions may include what is the mechanism of DC priming of T cells? What is the immunogenicity of an interesting or novel antigen or peptide? We might be interested in figuring out how to immunomodulate or enhance dendritic cell activation and subsequent T cell priming and activation. We can also use them to study T cell tolerance. And today we will be more focused on the last question of do antigen specific T cells have downstream vector functions, for example, anti tumor immunity? So to get things started, let's quickly review an important aspect of these co-cultures, antigen processing and presentation. As many of you may likely recall, we have two types of major histocompatibility complex, which are responsible for the presentation of antigenic peptides to T cells. Of note in human, we refer to MHC proteins as human leukocyte antigens, or HLA. MHC class II molecules are expressed on antigen presenting cells, such as dendritic cells, macrophages, and B cells, and can effectively present antigens to C or positive T cells. As demonstrated on the far right cartoon, this occurs when exogenous antigens are internalized, degraded, and loaded onto class II molecules. In contrast, MHC class I molecules are expressed on all nucleated cells and present peptide antigens to C8 positive T cells. As indicated on the left panel of the cartoon, these peptides are derived from endogenous pools of proteins, such as uh, viral or tumor antigens, where they are expressed, degraded, and loaded onto nascent MHC molecules for presentation to CD8 T cells. However, then, you may be wondering how DCs present peptides on class one molecules if they are not infected with the virus or expressing tumor antigens themselves. This involves an alternative pathway called cross-presentation, a phenomenon that is quite specific to dendritic cells. As demonstrated by the cartoon on the right, exogenous antigens can be internalized by dendritic cells, degraded, and loaded onto MHC class 1. Now, this is a very um, exciting and evolving area of research. Unfortunately, in the interest of time, I will not go into much detail of this process, but there are two prevalent models. One involves a vacuolar pathway, and the other is the endosome to cytosol pathway. Um, and it's a super interesting area, so I would really encourage you to delve deeper into this area 
that certainly has implications for the improvement of vaccine development and cancer therapies. To expand a bit more on MHC molecules, let's look at how their polymorphism affects which peptide antigens are selected for effective presentation to T cells. As demonstrated by the table on the top right, we have hundreds of HLA class one alleles in the human population, and each gives rise to variations within the peptide binding pocket. This will exert structural and electrostatic properties with respect to the length and the sequence of a peptide that can stably bind uh, the peptide binding group as depicted by the figure on the bottom right. So here, of course, we have um, an example of a class one molecule called HOAA201, and it has um, a very specific structure, and the peptide that will bind into it has very specific anchor residues uh, within it, and these peptides in class one are generally uh, eight to nine amino acids long. Additionally, our T cells are educated in the thymus during development to recognize peptides in the context of self MHC. So both the MHC and the peptide will interact with a given T cell receptor during the antigen presentation process. This interaction leads us to the idea of MHC restriction. Looking at the cartoon on the right and the leftmost panel, we will see that a T cell receptor will recognize protein X in the context of a particular cell MHC, which is HLA201 in this example. However, the same peptide on a different or non-self MHC molecule will not result in T cell recognition of the peptide. Additionally, the peptide specificity of that T cell receptor means that it will not recognize a different peptide, such as Y here in the far right, even if it's loaded onto a self MHC molecule. So what I'm trying to say over the last two slides is if you are going to use DC T cell co-cultures, to study antigen specific T cell responses, your antigen presenting cells and T cells must, be, must come from the same donor. Okay, so let's switch gears now and look at different sources of antigen. In some cases, a single peptide sequence can be used to activate antigen specific T cells. And this is most suitable when we have information about the HLA repertoire of the individual and which peptides are commonly and effectively presented by a particular HL allele to drive T cell activation. So an example here um, that we commonly use is this peptide called MART1, and this is derived from the protein uh, also called MART1, and it just so happens this very particular sequence, 26 through 35, is very effectively presented by HLA A201 molecules. However, if we do not have much insight about what peptide sequence are likely to drive T cell recognition, we might consider a synthetic peptide pool. Here, the sequence of an antigenic protein will be used to manufacture peptides of predetermined length, typically with overlapping sequences to improve the likelihood of finding an immunogenic peptide. An example here is a peptide pool that spans the region of an antigenic protein called PP65 that is derived from and expressed by human cytomegalovirus. This is also commonly used as a positive control in co-culture experiments because most individuals have, will have circulating memory anti-CMV T cells um, readily detectable in their system. Of course, there are other mechanisms that we can use, um, but they will not be uh, so much of our focus today. Um, human dendritic cells are actually a heterogeneous population of immune cells. They are derived from a common progenitor cell in the bone marrow. Upon entering the blood, these cells differentiate into plasmacytoid cells, otherwise known as PDCs, or two types of classical DCs known as CDCs. As indicated on the right, each DC subset expresses a unique set of phenotypic markers and has distinct functional properties. You might also note that the frequencies of the DC subsets on the right here are extremely low when compared to other circulating cell types such as monocytes. And this is a point that I will address in a later slide. So circulating dendritic cells 
have an immature phenotype and are actually not well suited for potent peptide presentation and activation of T cells. Immature DCs are characterized by high phagocytic capacity, meaning that they efficiently internalize exogenous antigens for processing. However, they express low levels of NHC and co-stimulatory molecules and do not generate cytokines that are needed to effectively prime T cell activation. If the immature DCEs are exposed to a milieu of cytokines and danger signals, such as PAMs and DAMs, they will reduce their phagocytic capacity and strongly upregulate proteins that will promote T cell activation, such as costimulatory and NHC molecules, as well as a number of inflammatory cytokines. However, each DC subset has distinctly different requirements to promote their transition to a mature DC, and this maturation makes sure and significantly affect downstream T cell activation and differentiation. So given this information, what source of dendritic cells will be feasible for our experiments? So here I've prepared a pros and cons list to consider when making this decision. Certainly having physiological dendritic cells of interest um, can be beneficial when you want to better understand the mechanisms that drive a particular DC T cell interaction. However, on the con side of things, these cells are extremely rare, and this means that you will need very large volumes of starting materials, such as blood or leukopath, to isolate the required number of DCs for your experiment. And of course, this can be very costly. And at the end of it all, you still will have a very limited supply of DCs that may severely reduce the scale of your experiment. So do we have another option? Yes, you can use a common cell culture technique to generate dendritic cells from monocytes. As we noted on a previous slide, monocytes are relatively abundant in blood. And there are several well-established protocols that can be used to generate either aminogenic or tolerogenic DCs, and this can be controlled by DC maturation cocktails. So here on the right, if we want tolerogenic DCs, uh, we will generally um, add a number of immunosuppressive mediators to the maturation mix. However, if we want um, immunogenic DCs to activate T cells, we will um, mature these immature DCs in the presence of a lot of pro-inflammatory mediators and cytokines. This will give rise then to um, dendritic cells that express high levels of post-inhibitory molecules and will generate a number of cytokines, including IL-12, which is really important for T-cell priming. Okay, first we need to isolate monocytes from peripheral blood nuclear cells. Our EasyCEP human monocyte isolation kit can easily and quickly isolate monocytes in 13 minutes, resulting in labeled free cells with high monocyte purity. The kit is available for small to large scale PBMC volumes, and can also be automated with the World SFC instrument. So the flow panel here on the top represents PBMCs before monocyte enrichment, and the purity of monocytes is indicated by staining for CD14. After isolation, of course, what we see um, is a very high purity of CD14 cells, and these cells are very suitable and for downstream applications. Isolated monocytes are then cultured in our immunocode DC kit, where the monocytes are exposed to a differentiation supplement, followed by a proprietary maturation supplement to generate mature DCs. Peptide antigens are added on day five of the culture. And of course, uh, the optimal concentration should be determined for your particular antigen of interest. I will also point out the components of our immunocult DC kit can be purchased separately. While we are certainly most familiar with the expected yield and performance of DCs generated by our supplements, we do recognize that some customers may want to control or test their own maturation supplements as a part of their research. So we do have several customers who purchase the immunocult AOF DC medium and immunocult DC differentiation supplements separately and then successfully implement their own maturation supplement for their DC studies. So here we see that monocyte-derived dendritic cells generated by the amenical DC kit express markers and cytokines that are important for priming T cell responses, 
such as post inventory molecules shown on the left graph and IL-12 production shown on the right graph. So now we will turn our attention to isolating T cells for co-culture work. Stem cell has numerous options for isolating T cells. Naive and memory CD8 or CD4 T cells can be isolated from PBMCs. And these kits are available uh, on numerous cell isolation platforms. For today's discussion, we will focus in on the PAN CD8 T cell isolation kit. So this kit, uh, called the EasySep Human CD8 T cell isolation kit, can isolate highly pure label three CD8 positive T cells in eight minutes. The flow plot on the left represents our starting PDMC population, while the plot on the right demonstrates a highly pure CD8 positive, CD3 positive cell population after isolation. We've discussed how we obtain highly purified monocytes and CD8 T cells from PBMCs, but where do we actually get these PBMCs? Stem cell actually offers a selection of products, including Lupapax, whole blood, or frozen PBMCs. Alternatively, customers can generate their own PBMCs and cryopreserve them in a very popular uh, cryostore CS10 cryopreservation medium. So for the next uh, couple of minutes then, um, I'm going to expand a little bit more on uh, the logistics of how to actually set up these uh, experiments so that you have the right cells at the right time. So if we're starting with a Leukopack sample, um, you have two options. You can either proceed with the isolation of monocytes from your fresh Leukopack sample and immediately begin the differentiation to DCs. Or two, you can prepare PBMCs and then cryopreserve them in a cryostorm medium. You then thaw the PBMCs using our recommended thaw protocol and isolate monocytes from your source of cryopreserved PBMCs and then begin the culturing process to generate monocyte-derived dendritic cells. Please note that you will not require a source of CD8 T cells until the monocytes have differentiated into mature DCs, a process which takes several days. To best preserve your CD8 T cells, try to preserve a portion of your Leukopack PBMC sample the same day of delivery, then thaw them and rest the PBMCs overnight in IL-7 to better restore T cell function. Then isolate your CD8 T cells and co-culture them with mature peptide-loaded monocyte-derived endotric cells. A quick word of caution, I do not recommend resting the cells in IL-2 supplemented culture as this may result in non-specific antigen T cell activation and this may interfere with the detection of antigen-specific T cell responses in your downstream application. Next, let's look at blood as the starting material for your experiment. Overall, the logistics of whole blood samples are very similar to Leukopat. However, PBMCs must be first enriched from whole blood using a density, density gradient reagent such as Linker prep. Optionally, you can also use septonate tubes for greater ease and convenience. Once PBMCs are ready, you can elect to isolate and culture monocytes immediately, or you can cryopreserve them in cryostore 10 and thaw them at your convenience. Similarly to the Leukopack sample, PBMCs should be thawed right before you are ready for the co-culture with monocyte, mature monocyte-derived T cells. Okay, now that we have reviewed antigen immune cell sources, let's now discuss the variables that we need to consider to optimize our co-cultures. Our recommended T cell medium is a medium called XF T cell expansion medium for the expansion of human T cells. Of course, this formulation has been in fact optimized to support T cell expansion, and it's a serum-free formulation. If you do wish to add serum in your co-culture experiments, please note that you may need to validate um, this, your serum. Be aware of the lot-to-lot -lot variability. And serum, especially um, FBS, may non-specifically activate T cells. 
Cytokines can be a tricky business. Too much cytokine or poorly timed cytokine additions can pose problems when trying to detect antigen-specific T cell responses. So I would recommend some optimization experiments to find the most effective cytokines for your specific research questions. Cytokines such as IL-2 or IL-15 will promote non-antigen driven T cell activation and proliferation, especially if they are at the beginning of your DC T cell cell culture. Question that we get quite commonly from our customers is this um, aspect of DC to T cell ratios. This of course is dependent on a number of different uh, factors. For example, the health and viability of your mature DCs. If you do not have healthy DCs going into your pro culture, you may find that you need to add uh, more of them. One could also make the same argument if your CD8 T cells are not uh, really healthy and viable going into your pro culture. Another aspect here is the frequency of antigen specific CD8 T cells. Rare peptide specific CD8 T cells will likely require DC T cell work. So ratios between 1 to 2 to 1 in 10. Higher peptide-specific CD8 T cell frequencies will likely need BC T cell ratios of 1 to 4 to 1 in 20. And if you're looking at allogeneic um, co-cultures, you in fact need very, very few DCs to elicit allogen-specific T cell responses. If you're doing CD4 DC T DC co-cultures, um, generally, um, most people will set them up at higher ratios. Now, please bear in mind, these are very general statements. And ultimately, we need to work out the optimal DC T cell ratio um, experimentally. So you know, as part of your optimization, I would recommend setting up two to three of these different ratios. So now you need to decide how long you should co-culture. So short-term co-cultures are most suitable for um, probing whether or not dendritic cells are in fact activating your CD8 T cells. So for example, if we're screening for novel immunogenic antigens or peptides. Whereas longer-term co-culture uh, really supports the expansion of antigen-specific T cells, so we can ask questions such as, are antigen-specific CD8 T cells functional? In other words, we want to know if they can say kill tumor target cells. Short DC CD8 T cell co culture. This is an example of how you might set this up. So, of course, you will derive monocyte derived dendritic cells, pulse them with peptide. You will isolate your CD8 T cells if you wish to do a proliferation experiment as a, a readout of T cell activation. You can label it with a proliferation dye. You then local culture them at the optimal DCT ratio. If you wish to add cytokines, then you should do so at the optimal conditions for your experiment. At the end of the co culture, um, you may look at things such as activation markers and proliferation um, by full cytometry techniques. You can also use reagents such as HLA class 1 peptide specific tetramers um, if that is suitable for your particular system. For long-term expansion of antigen-specific CD8 T cells, again, we will derive our monocyte-derived dendritic cells. We will generate a pure source of CD8 T cells, set them up at the optimal DC to T cell ratio, which may be different than the one you would use for a short uh, co-culture experiment. We then add IL-21 to promote the priming of antigen-specific CD8 T cells. All other activation and survival signals should be um, met when the CD8 T cell encounters cognate peptide MHC. We then delay and add IL-7 and IL-15 to promote expansion of antigen-specific CD8 T cells until day three. And this allows our antigen-specific T cells to have a bit of an advantage over the non antigen specific CD8 T cells. So that when we add IL-15 in there, um, it's those cells that will be most promoted to expand. And ultimately you will then 
split and transfer your cells to larger plates as the expansion process continues. At the end of your culture, again, you can use flow cytometry techniques to look at phenotype and activation markers of your expanded CD8 T cells, as well as detect expanded antigen specific cells with HLA class 1 tetramers if that's available to you. So, in the bottom below, we look at our no peptide negative control, um, looking at PE tetramer versus CD8 staining. And the flow plot on the right is after cells have been co-cultured in the presence of CMV class 1 peptides. I've also provided a little calculation here. If you're interested in your yields, you will take the number of viable cells per mill, multiply by that volume of your harvested culture, and then multiply by the frequency of your tetramer specific CDA T cells as determined by your flow cytometry analysis. So once we have expanded these CDA T cells, of course, we want to know, um, are they functional? Now, in order to do this, you may need to re-expose those expanded CD8 T cells to a fresh source of antigen. And this is because during the expansion process, the original peptides and monocyte derived DCs are basically long gone. So you can um, either generate a new batch of monocyte derived DCs from a match donor, or you can use a magnetic bead-based enrichment strategy from your donor match PBMCs to enrich for antigen presenting cells such as DCs, BCs, B cells, and monocytes. Um, and this technique is going to be available to our customers on our website or if you contact our product scientific support team. So if we are looking at, for example, interferon gamma responses on the bottom left, we have our control ABCs that do not, uh, that were not treated with a fresh source of peptides. And we had very low levels of interferon gamma production and see very low levels of CD107 um, detection as an indicator of the degranulation process. Once we add peptides to these APCs, uh, what you should see is a robust um, increase in the number of interferon gamma producing cells, which will also have a CD107 positive um, signature. The bottom right here is simply looking at um, activation induced markers, in this case 401 EB, upon stimulation with fresh um, peptide antigen. Uh, the control here is on the right, and we're also co-staining this with our tetramer. Upon peptide loading of these APCs, uh, these tetramer specific cells show signs of activation as indicated by 401 BB staining. So, while you will definitely see an enrichment of antigen-specific CD8 T cells, they are not necessarily going to be 100% purity infected. I guarantee you that they probably will not be. Um, an example of one of these cultures is shown uh, on the flow, play, flow plot on the right, where only 20% of our CD8 T cells are actually our antigen-specific population. So this may be uh, challenging or concerning if you would like to perform B BDJ sequencing. Uh, or analyze antigen-specific CD8 T cell phenomenon technology. And these contaminating nonspecific uh, CD8 T cells um, are pretty activated and express cytotoxic proteins. And when you use them in a uh, killing assay, you may find that you see a very high background level in, within your controls. And I will show you that in just a second. An answer to this might be enriching antigen-specific CD8 T cells to improve the specificity of your killing assay. So just a quick uh, overview of how the cell isolation process works. Uh, you will label your cells with your PE conjugated tetramer. You will then add a cocktail that will recognize uh, PE. You will add your rapid releasable particle. These will then be uh, put in a magnet for a number of rounds. Um, and then we actually have the option of releasing the particle using a release buffer. And an example of one of these isolations are given on the bottom here. Before isolation, our tetramer-specific T cells constituted about 5% of the population. And after isolation, we generally see 
enrichment ranges from 80 to 95 percent tetramer specific cells. Um, and how enriched you want it will depend on the number of rounds of magnetic separation we decide to use. Once we get to our killing assay, we have some decisions to make. Your target cells can either be patient matched tumor, tumor cells, which of course is the most ideal situation uh, and something I did not have access to. Um, you, however, can use engineered target cells that express the HLA class one molecule of interest or a cell line that naturally expresses the HLA class one molecule of interest. Now, what you will do with these target cells in order to generate a negative control is you will leave these cells without any peptide loading. So this is going to be our background target killing. To look at specific killing, we will load uh, another set of targets with our peptide of interest. If I can draw your attention then to the graph in the top right, the gray lines in this killing curve represent samples where the expanded CD8 T cells have not been enriched. And what I'm trying to demonstrate here is that your control and your peptide loaded target cells essentially give us the exact same curve. Once we enrich our antigen specific CD8 T cells, what we will see with the orange bar here is that the killing of these peptide loaded targets are considerably higher than our background control. So uh, in summary, DC T cell co-culture is a versatile assay that can be modified for a number of research interests. However, your assays may need some optimization to best address your research question and to generate quality data. Stem cell does offer a number of reliable reagents for your DC T cell co-culture workflows. And we are happy to share our experiences with you. Um, we're happy to help. So please reach out to us if you have questions. Um, and just a quick overview of some other products that have been featured in this presentation. And with that, I'm ready to take questions and I really thank everyone for your time and attention today. Excellent, thanks so much, Catherine. Um, I'll leave up the slide here in case anybody wants to give them a scan, but we'll now move on to the Q&A. Um, all right, so first question here, um, can we do a second round of CD8 expansion? Uh, yeah, so the answer to that, generally speaking, is is yes. Um, however, there are going to be probably some, some modifications that you'll make. Um, by this point, you will have had already one round of enrichment of those antigen-specific CD8 T cells. Um, so you can probably get away with perhaps using fewer dendritic cells to drive those the next round of T cell expansion. Um, you may also want to change up, however, your, your cytokine regimen um, in the concentration that you're using. At this point, you may decide to use um, IL-2 to improve viability. Uh, the downside with um, subsequent uh, expansion rounds, though, are that uh, there's always the risk that you could exhaust those T cells um, and definitely will be changing their, their phenotype to a very uh, effector-like uh, phenotype. So these are just some of the things that uh, one should keep in mind. Right. Yeah. Great points. Um, can I use positively selected T cells? Right. Uh, so we do get this question fairly uh, often. So let's look at sort of three scenarios then. Uh, if you're doing pan T cells, if you isolate cells using a CD3 positive selection approach, um, bear in mind that is going to interact with a component of the T cell receptor. And there's a, a pretty good likelihood that you're going to see some basal level of stimulation. Um, if you look at CD4 positive uh, T cell selection, CD4 of course is expressed on other cells besides T cells. Uh, so you may end up with contaminating things like monocytes, for example. CD8 is particularly problematic. Um, as CD8 can also be expressed on NKT cells as well as uh, NK cells. Um, and so these cells will basically use the same cytokines and, and all the growth factors that you put in there as your antigen-specific T cells 
and you're actually adding even more competition to the system. So I would kind of recommend that you don't do that. Uh, the negative um, isolation techniques are really nice. Um, they're very pure and they will get rid of a lot of those contaminating um, and potentially problematic cell subsets. Fantastic, yeah, great answer. Um, all right, uh, what are some other DC maturation approaches? Well, um, it, it kind of depends on what you're using as a source to begin with. If you, uh, you know, decide to go for the, the blood-derived dendritic cells directly, um, so the CDC1, the CDC2s um, do respond and mature to different uh, danger signals and, and respond differently to cytokines. Um, so while a lot of people will use, like I say, a TLR9 agonist of some kind, because that can be used sort of across the board. Um, however, others don't want to use that and are more specific to the subsets of interest. So um, like a CDC1, perhaps you're using a TLR3 agonist or something like that. Um, however, if you use the monocyte derived dendritic cells, of course, you can also play around with those um, maturation signals as well. Um, what I've known from my own experience, depending on what I'm using, you may see differences in co maturing molecules. Um, some cells become a lot stickier under some um, maturation cocktails, um, and so it can be harder to work with. So at the end of the day, it, there's there's a lot of diversity out there, which is why we give customers the option of, of even using their own uh, system. Excellent. Um... Nice question here. So when working with cytokines, what are some considerations that we would need to account for? Right. Um, well, most um, publications, including our own, um, recommend using cytokines in concentration of nanograms per mil. Um, now, the thing is with cytokines, of course, is it's not so much the concentration that's necessarily the key is it's the biological activity. Um, and so you have to be very aware that if you change sources of cytokines or even different lots of cytokines, if you're using it at the same concentration, you could still end up with slightly different biological activities. So um, when I'm planning experiments like this, I, I try to plan ahead so that uh, the cytokines that I'm using are from the same source and even the same lot to reduce that variability. Fantastic. Um... Next question here, are these processes applicable to mouse derived cells from blood and tissue uh, single cell suspensions? Um, generally speaking, the system can be used in mice. Um, however, most people will get um, their myeloid sources from bone marrow. Um, and these are called bone marrow derived dendritic cells. And so these are the ones that are most commonly used um, in the literature. Um, and then, of course, you can need a, a source of T cells. Again, it's you're going to get a lot more cells if you probably tap into things like spleen, for example. Um, but overall, um, the idea is similar. However, the concentrations of your cytokines, the duration of your cultures, um, the, the, the things that you use for DC maturation um, may be somewhat different than what you use for the human system. Thanks. Good question. Great. Um, and now are IPSC derived DCs comparable to Mo DC in this co-culture system or better? Um, I'm, I'm going to say I don't know because I've never done the head to head comparison. Um, it, a lot of that might depend, of course, on your DC differentiation system from um, IPS cells. Um, some people will take an approach of uh, the PSE to a monocyte and then use potentially even somewhat similar signals as peripheral blood monocytes to get to the final DC stage. But um, there's a lot of nuances and a lot of different approaches to that. So that right now all I can say is you, you would have to try it yourself. Perfect. Um, all right, Catherine, do you have any tips on activating naive CD8 T cells? Um, well, I would say that the monocyte-derived dendritic cell approach that we have, um, 
does work reasonably well. So in the technical bulletin, we're actually, um, in fact, trying to expand naive CD8 T cells but that are responsive to the MART1 peptide um, um, on the HLA A201 uh, HLA background. Um, and so this is where the addition of IL-21 has definitely been beneficial. If you don't add it in there, you will definitely see a difference in your, your final yields. Um, you can also, of course, um, use an actual naive CD8 T cell isolation kit um, to enrich, I guess, potentially on those very, very, very rare um, antigen specific T cells rather than using a pan CD8 T cell um, population to start with. Fantastic. Um, all right. Is there a way of minimizing increased expression of activation markers like CD154 and CD69 during expansion of CD4 T cells, particularly during expansions taking more than seven days? Um, let's see, I'm not sure if I've followed all the kinetics of this in my experiments before. Um, I mean, the antigen specific T cells themselves um, should have a, have a kinetics to them, um, as long as you are not throwing in a whole lot of other activation signals. So if you just have the DC and the CD4 T cells, the first three days, you will probably see a peak expression of the CD154 and CD69. However, when you add some of these expansion cytokines, it's possible that some of those will come up again. Um, so um, right now, I, I can't definitively say that, um, other than for to watch things like um, sources of serum, like I don't use any and sort of take that very below because if you're using FBS, you're always going to be triggering some level of basal activation. Um, and monitoring your, your cultures and making sure that they have room to expand. And uh, what you should actually see is a lot of T cells probably dying off at some point because they haven't had that antigen uh, induced activation and survival signals. So that's so unfortunately, it's maybe the best I could do with that question at the moment. Excellent. Um, how is the DC T cell co-culture different or better than just doing a regular one to two week PBMC expansion uh, by treating the PBMCs with peptides or antigens of interest? Right. Um, so actually, if you're starting with a memory T cell population, uh, such as CMV, uh, I have successfully been able to expand uh, those CMV reactive T cells just using a PBMC approach. Um, however, you don't tend to quite get the same level of yield at the end of it all. Um, naive T cell responses, however, definitely are going to benefit from the DC T cell co-culture approach um, as those, those DCs are, are, that's what their job is, is really to prime naive T cell responses. Perfect. Um, all right. Uh, which culture media is used during co-culture and does this affect the phenotypes of the other cell types? Um, so we were using the Aminocult uh, XF T cell expansion medium. Um, we, we successfully use this and recommend this to, to people with the CAR T with cell workflows as well. Um, it's possible that modulate, but using different uh, mediums that you could have some impact on the final phenotype of your expanded T cells. Um, I can't say I've done any head to head testing of that. So that would have to be something that would, that would need to be tested head to head, I think, to under, better understand those, those differences. Excellent. Um, how can the biological functions like antigen presentation or phagocytosis of human MDCs be affected if we used positive selection of the CD14 monocytes without release of the beads? Right. Um, so during development of our immunical DC uh, differentiation kit, um, our team did look at both the negative selection for, for monocytes as well as the CD14 positive selection approach. Um, both of them will give you, you know, fairly nice DC, DC cultures in the end and the expression of IL-12. Uh, the big difference I think that we noted in house here is that the yield um, tends to be much higher with the negative um, isolation approach compared to the, the CD14 positive approach. However, 
um, both of them will ultimately get the job done. Okay, excellent. Um, so uh, what would you do if you didn't see the expansion of the CD8 T cells? Right, so there's, there's a number of things that, that could have happened there. Uh, you may perhaps did not get um, very viable DCs in the end, or they failed to mature into DCs. Um, certainly there's a number of ways that you can, or approaches you can use to, to determine whether or not that was an issue. Um, so after the DC differentiation stage, you can stain these uh, DCs then for uh, the presence of CD83 as well as co-stimulatory molecules. Uh, they should have downregulated CD14. Um, you could also collect the cell culture supernatant at that point and, and look at IL-12 levels. So that would all be signatures of the, the differentiation process for some reason did not work. Um, for the antigen loading thing, this is where actually I like to use a positive control, such as the CMV peptide pools. Um, so if you have individuals that have mem circulating memory T cells um, that you're using in your uh, co-culture systems, um, they should respond quite well to uh, the CMV positive peptide control pool. Um, so the, these are sort of like the things that I do to, to monitor it for those particular aspects. Excellent, great answer. Um, all right, this person writes, hi, have you ever done, uh, have you done phenotyping of DCs at day five of differentiation uh, before adding maturation con uh, the, before adding the maturation cocktail? And what phenotypes would they have? Um, so they should have downregulated CD14 by that point. Um, however, they will likely be CD83 negative and will have much lower levels of co-stimulatory molecules and MHC um, levels compared to those after the maturation system or um, step. Excellent. Um, what concentration of IL-21 can you recommend to add for priming the antigen-specific CD8 and at what timing? Uh, so I added in at, right at time zero of co-culture. Um, in the protocol that we um, have, are making available uh, to our customers, we have a technical bulletin coming out. Um, I've been using 30 nanograms per mil final concentration. Um, However, that, that also might be a play, place where you need to optimize things just a little bit depending on uh, on your model system. Perfect. Is the method of co-culture the same for monocyte-derived DC and the circulating DCs? Um, yes and no. <laughs> um, the circulating DCs, like I said, they're very rare, but they also tend to be quite fussy. Um, and sometimes you will find that they will crash out on you. Um, you also may, depending on what kind of circulating DCs you're working with, um, that will also dictate what kind of maturation steps that you take to get them to that final antigen pre presenti presenting stage to prime T cells. Um, so in theory, they're somewhat similar. However, your DC to T ratios might be different. And like I said, I, I do find them more challenging to work with in terms of keeping them alive and happy. Excellent, thanks. Um, we have a few questions here about different combinations of co-cultures. Uh, one is asking about a system for monocyte and, and K co-culture, and then another asking about a DC and CD for positive T-cell co-cultures. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I'll speak more to the CD4 uh, T-cell co-culture. Um, overall, you can kind of use a similar system to what we've seen for CD8s. However, um, there are some differences. Um, again, CD4s will have different sensitivities to cytokines, so you will, might have to play around with that a little bit. So you, you may not use exactly the same concentrations that we use for the CD8 uh, co-cultures. Um, of course, they're also going to be more responsive to antigens on class two. So uh, your source of antigen is, is also going to be different. And that antigen processing step might have slightly different kinetics than, than a peptide approach as well. Um, uh, CD4s also can express more abundant levels of cytokines such as IL-2 all by themselves. So there, there are definitely nuances 
um, between the two T cell subsets. Um, full disclosure, I don't think I've ever done a DCNK co-culture before. Um, but if I were, I, I might follow somewhat something similar to what I'm doing for the CD8s, except without the, the antigen present. But um, I would say, yeah, you're, you, you're kind of up for a lot of optimization there because um, only some of it might be actually translatable between the CD8 and NK system. Right, yeah, great points. For artificial antigen presentation systems, what, kind, uh, what cytokines would you think are most necessary for the naive CD8 T cell uh, expansion? Well, yeah, I think the IL-21 priming would still be beneficial unless, of course, your antigen presenting, uh, your artificial antigen presenting cell is doing that itself. Um, however, if you still are going to need things like uh, an IL-15 or an IL-2 um, approach in order to then expand those uh, antigen-specific T cells. Um, and of course, Everything, once you change up your antigen in your model systems, I mean, there's there's always going to be still some, some level of optimization that's required. Perfect. Um, all right, what, which inoculum of monocytes do you find most suitable to produce MO DCs? I've been struggling with losing lots of cells along the seven days, uh, seven day period. What inoculum? Um, I'm not sure if I'm quite clear on what the question here is, but um, we do have, uh, with our Aminocall DC differentiation kit, uh, there are tips and tricks even within that that you, that you could play with. We generally seed ourselves at one times 10 to the six cells per mil. Um, and then um, we, we do replace the Benia at day three. Um, without too much disturbing of, of that monolayer. Um, and then finally, then you just add the DC maturation supplement right to everything without removing anything. You can also plug in your, your peptides at that point as well. Um, so once we seed our cells, we don't do a ton of manipulation, which is probably helpful for them. Um, so any ways that you can sort of minimize um, the manipulation is probably going to be helpful for them. Excellent. Um, is it possible to do an expansion of dendritic cells in particular? Um, I'm going to say probably not on that. Um, yeah, DCs don't, they don't tend to proliferate. Um, so if, if you start off with a, you know, a monocyte population, um, generally your yield of that monocyte to the final DC stage is going to be somewhere between probably 25 to 50 percent of the cells that you started with, um, depending on the donor um, and whether or not it's a fresh source, a prior preserved source. Um, all of these things can can come into play. Right. Um, all right. Uh, which things should be kept in mind when doing CD4 mixed lymphocyte reactions with tissue derived DCs? <laughs> um, well, again, that's that's a very challenging uh, application. I think again, you're you're going to be uh, challenged um, on keeping those tissue derived DCs happy and healthy. Um, of course, tissue derived DCs can also be a very heterogeneous mixture of dendritic cells as well. Um, so not all the cells are going to respond equally to your maturation signals. Um, and not all of them are going to be equally suited for T cell priming. Um, so it's a very challenging system, and I've never actually done it myself. So I don't feel it's, it, I'm probably the best uh, expert to, to speak on that. Excellent. Well, to the person that asked that question, best of luck with your work. Um, <laughs> so when working with class one HLA, does it make a difference to use DCs or any other uh, nucleated cells? Um, so for the, the T cell priming um, part, your DCs are still going to be your best choice. Um, however, um, you may have picked up during the secondary stimulation to look at things like interferon gamma production or even killing assays. Um, those were not done on DCs. Um, so once the naive T cells or even memory T cells have been primed, um, 
you don't necessarily need to use DCs as your source of uh, peptide presentation. Um, at that point, you can you can then explore other types of, of you know presenting presenting cells at that point. Perfect. Um, all right. Can I use just one immunocult medium? Well, um, I can say that the, the protocol that we have in our technical bulletin um, is, is the most optimal um, approach. So that is the DC maturation is in uh, one media and then the T cell co-culture is in a different media. If I ha absolutely had to pick between the two, I think I would probably go with the immunocult uh, XF for T cell expansion um, because that is going to be the most suitable for your T cell priming activation and expansion. Excellent. Um, so as you mentioned, D cell, DCs and T cells should stem from the same donor. Uh, could you say any words about allergenic CD4 mixed lymphocyte reactions? I think this is coming from maybe the same person. Any pros or cons or, uh, you know, I mentioned challenges. Yeah, so allergenic cultures, um, that, is a, that, that is a different system for sure. Um, first of all, most of us have relatively high levels of allo antigen specific T cells in circulation because they were not eliminated during the T cell um, selection process in your thymus. Um, so you're generally starting with a relatively high frequency of allo antigen specific T cells. Um, and I mean, the allo system is really potent. Um, and so uh, I certainly have noted that I don't need as many DCs to get things going. Um, and you may, you may even change up your, your cytokine regimens there as well. Really reduce or not use a lot of cytokines at all. It just depends on what your, your final readout is going to be. Um, so um, the only other thing I think that you need to keep in mind, especially if you're using human, uh, systems here is that if you have a responder CD4 population and you stimulate it from cells from three different donors, you will likely get three different, very different responses. <laughs> so uh, not every stimulator population, depending on their uh, HLA repertoire and whatnot, is going to give you exactly the same amount of reactive CD4 T cells. Fantastic. And I think in the interest of time, we'll just have one last question, maybe a forward facing question. So um, are there any new upcoming developments or new research avenues opening up that you're particularly looking forward to in the future? Um, yeah, I mean, I was I've been, was actually reading a, uh, a review fairly recently on DCs and immunotherapy and whatnot. Um, and I think it's no surprise that if you've been uh, you know, looking at the whole COVID-19 vaccine approaches and the use of uh, LNPs and all these sorts of things. I think this is a really interesting area going out uh, in the market right now. Um, I think we do have probably few customers who are uh, looking at this or more effective vaccine approaches. So I, I actually think that, that one is, is a pretty cool area right now. Awesome. Well, Catherine, thanks so much for all your great insights today. Uh, it's really been a pleasure having you with us. Thank you for having me and uh, thank you very much for the, to the audience for a lot of really interesting questions. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Big thanks to the audience here for participating. And in closing, we hope you enjoyed this scientist.com inside scientific and stem cell technologies webinar. And we'll see you again next time. Have a great day, everyone.